So I'm Dominique Vargas. I'm a third year PhD student in the English department. And it's April 4th, 2019. Um, and I'm honored to be joined by Ingrid. Ingrid Rojas Contreras is joining me today. And um, she'll be reading this evening at the Notre Dame Center for Arts and Culture. And she graciously gave us some time today at the Institute for Latino Studies to do a little bit of an interview. We're going to talk about a little bit about you and your life, and then a lot about your writing. Um, so welcome, and thank you for thank joining you. me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, like I said, I have a range of questions that pull from your novel, which is um, your debut novel, Fruit of the Drunken Tree, and some of your essays, and then more generally about gender and politics and migration and um, family, things like that. So um, first, if I may, if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I know that your novel has some of your experiences as inspiration, but um, I wonder if you could just give us a little introduction and talk about yourself and then maybe yourself as a writer. Sure. Um, so I, I grew up in Bogota in Colombia, and my family and I left when I was 14 uh, because of the violence uh, of the country. We went to Venezuela, and uh, I think it was it was there when I really started to write. Uh, I had so many things, you know, after everything that uh, our family went through, I had so many things that I felt like I needed to kind of untangle or say, and the writing was one way in which I could do that. I started to write in English then, even though I was in Venezuela. And I think it's, I just wanted more privacy. Mm -hmm. And I knew that my family is very nosy. So if I wrote anything down, I knew that they would, in Spanish, I knew that they would find it and, and read it. Right. So my parents didn't speak English. So it was the, it was kind of this, you know, ultimate um, diary right. that I could keep. Uh, I started to write in English then, um, and it kind of it, it felt like a like a saving grace mm -hmm. to me uh, to be able to talk about my experiences in this very private way. When when I became um, a writer, it it also and I emigrated to the United States. There was something about writing in, in a second language that was parallel to being an immigrant, where you're also in a, in a country that's not your own. Mm -hmm. So it made sense that I would address myself in a language that wasn't my own, or try to make home in a, in a language that you know, wasn't made for me. Um, so I, I always loved writing in English for that reason. Um, and I always, when I write, I always try to make it sound a little bit like Spanish when I'm writing. Um, I think that's definitely palpable in the novel. Yeah, I yeah. have questions about language and how you work yeah. with it. Yeah. What do you think about that strangeness or that estrangement? Do you feel like it was a very particular choice to do it that way, or it just naturally happened that way? With language that you would write in English rather than in Spanish. I think it was. I think it was just uh, at the time it was a practical thing, um, and and the, but there was something about the experience of feeling like I could address myself outside of uh, what I had grown up in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was very liberating to do that. I think when, when, you're, when you're young and you finally go to college, you get that experience. You feel like for the first time you are becoming your own person. I got that with, with writing in English, that, that sense of um, being alone in the world and also which can feel scary but but it also has a richness to it yeah so it's, i think it started as a practical choice and then and then i started to see parallels with it so to this day i always get confused with um in or on okay because in in spanish we just have in right right <laughs> So, so I always so it's fun to to write in an, in a language where you the the rules don't come naturally, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, when I was when I was writing the book, I was I was doing a lot of uh, language experiments too. Yeah. Do you feel like that's a relationship that you cultivate to English, or do you feel like it's a struggle? Uh, I think it's something that I cultivate. I when I was in Chicago, I went to school in Chicago. I was I was working as a translator. Okay. So I was I was translating articles for newspapers, 
and then I did some interpretation work. Um, and you know, when I when I was writing the novel, there was something that that was so interesting to me about how when you're interpreting, you you hear one language and then immediately you're speaking in another. And I didn't, I don't know what happens in your brain that allows you to do that, but it seems some kind of magical alchemy yes, to me. Definitely. So I, when, I was, I, when I was writing, uh, because that was my work, um, I started to do it in, with the book as well. Right. So I would imagine and hear the, the world in Spanish and then, you know, the dialogue and everything, right. all the descriptions. I would right. think of it in Spanish. And then by the time that I would type it, I would type it in English. So I was doing my own translation. Wow. So I kind of think of uh, the Fruit of the Drunken Tree as a translation, because I didn't conceive of it in, in English to begin with. So there's, there's places where I, where I transliterate words. I mean, Fruit of the Drunken Tree is a transliteration. Right. And it sounds strange in English. Right. Um, but again, there's that wonderful parallel to when you come from somewhere else uh, and you bring your own language and your own customs, like you, you seem strange to your surroundings, maybe. Right. So I, I wanted the book to feel like that, too. That's excellent. You're hitting on so many things that I have kind of woven throughout here about language, about magic, um, and I think a little bit about that sort of give and take relationship that's definitely there. So. Um, in your essay that you wrote for BuzzFeed last year, which was titled The Best Thing My Psychic Mom Taught Me, is that no one wants to hear the truth, which I love. I love that title. Um, you wrote about your mother and then your grandfather, her father, right? Um, as, and there may be sort of conflicted relationship with the art that they practice. And so um, the essay goes on to talk about the power of stories and metaphor and, um, and finding the right words. And so I was wondering sort of like what your relationship with writing is like. You've already talked about it a little bit, but um, how do you get to the truth? And is there truth with a capital T or is it more malleable truth for different people? Mm -hmm. um, I am, yeah, I am always interested in, in truth, whether it's emotional truth or, yeah, I think mostly emotional truth is what I'm going for. Um, with the, so with the novel is based on and something that happened to me and my family, and I wasn't as interested in telling the real story, uh, but maybe I'll tell you what, what it's based on. So um, when, uh, so in Colombia, I, I think this is common also to many South American countries, we, we hire uh, people to be maids and nannies, um, and so, uh, throughout my life, my my mom hired different women to be uh, maids and, and nannies in our house. Um, and we didn't have a lot of money, so it always surprised me uh, that anybody would take the job because it also didn't pay well, but we also didn't have money to even do that. Um, but um, one of these one of these young women um, was, I think maybe 14 or 15, which is kind of the other shocking thing, because um, I we I would be, you know, I think I was maybe 10 or 11 around this time, and so to have someone living with you in your house that's also similar age, but your lives are so different, right. was very unsettling to me, and it was very kind of disturbing and shocking, um, and I I we we always got super involved in, in their lives. Um, but so one of these girls um, was living in guerrilla occupied territory. And she, uh, and this is in Bogota, and then she was threatened by the guerrillas into acting against our family. And they told her, if you don't do this, we, we will start killing your family members. Um, so that to be so young and to be have that choice put on you uh, felt like such an unfair thing. Uh, so that so the book um, tells uh, a story that is similar to that, um, and I couldn't I didn't I wasn't interested in in writing it as nonfiction. Although in the beginning I did 
try right. to do that. But there were, there were. I think there were so many. Uh, I just couldn't. Yeah, when I when I tried to write it as nonfiction, I kept getting kind of blocked by the by all the emotions that I that I was having. I think I was just too close to it. Um, so there was something that happened when it became fiction, and I changed the characters' names, and then the situation was also different. Um, that even though it was fiction, I feel like it got to the emotional truth of what happened in a way that writing nonfiction um, could not. Oh, that's fascinating. I really like that almost, again, that strangeness kind of made it easier to get to that, that kernel of emotional truth. Yeah. So I think when I'm when I'm writing, I'm always just very interested in emotional truth, and to you know I think when to just kind of make a parallel to my to my mother, um, when she's yeah so she had a psychic business in the attic of our house, and uh, I watched her give readings many times, mm -hmm. um, and there's so much storytelling in that, um, and it I think it it has to do too with she has to. Uh, kind of divine and tell the the person sitting across from her what what their lives are like and what what their like innermost fears are right which is such a strange thing for her to try to do right um, so it was a fascinating process to see um, but but that also um, is about getting to an emotional truth right. and less about you know facts so when you were writing in Venezuela and you were first writing in English and sort of keeping it, I know what you mean, the diaries are never as yeah. <laughs> But um, did, were you writing fiction or do you were you writing about your life and about a sort of like closer sort of diary sort of relationship with writing? I was, I was writing about uh, my life um, and I was also doing, um, I was just really interested in, in writing and how writing worked. Um, and I, I was just constantly mesmerized by coming across a description of something that really allowed me to live in the moment of that description. So I would also sit in front of my journal and then describe something for pages because I really wanted to get good at it. So I would maybe like sit in front of a glass of water and then just describe that endlessly. Right. And the other thing that I was doing was I was writing these very short uh, fictions. So just maybe like a paragraph long, okay. like short story. That's interesting. So do you think that sort of like cultivated a writing practice for you? I think it's so fascinating, like to the difference between cultivating a writing practice for yourself and like being driven to do it versus like being told you should write every day or you should <laughs> do this for so many hours every day or you should do these kinds of exercises. I think that there's something to be said for something that's more personal or something that drives yeah. you. Yeah, I think I was, um, I was definitely felt like it was saving me because I felt so unmoored uh, when I was in Venezuela. And I also think that when, you know, just after arriving, you know, we've left everything behind. Um, I had this copy of Julio Cortazar short stories with me. And I remember I would just sit in our, in our new uh, apartment and with the book open and just reading the same paragraph over and over again. And I think I was just so kind of heartbroken and so br just broken by the experience that um, I was looking for something to, to save me. And so I, I had that moment where I think it was La Autopista del Sur is what I was reading. I had this moment where the the words on the page felt like they were they were saving me in in a way that so I always so from that moment I felt that language was providing something like an anchor. Yeah, writing was providing. Did you providing feel like an anchor. it was a contemplative practice, or was it just the act of being able to read and sit and be with words, or was it a contemplative sort of like wrote I'm doing this to rid myself of certain emotions or something like that? How do you I think, think it was both. I think it was both. I feel like I um, I just I wanted something to contain me because I felt very uncontained. Um, and language is, you know, uh, something that can provide a, a, you know, a context for you and, and you can build it yourself and you can undo it and you can recast it. 
Um, so it, it felt like I had found something that no matter where I was, I could anchor myself. Um, and so that makes sense, right? Because we, we, we didn't even stay in Venezuela after that. We, we stayed there for a year, then we went to Argentina, um, then Colombia again, then I came to the US. So I, w I was moving around so much and I was kind of losing constantly um, home right. that, that it really felt necessary that I, that I have some kind of anchor. Yeah, and I think that like, sort of circuitous or elliptical movement can be very unmooring, as yeah. you say. So, like, the anchor could be really important. That's great. Um, so do you think, then, that writing requires some kind of magical or magical element? Well, I think many people write without that being present. Mm. Um, but it's definitely important for me. Um, I, I am a writer who, who thinks of, of language as maybe more than just words on a page. Right. Um, I think that there is that there is magic to you casting an image and for a reader to meet you in that image and kind of your two worlds meeting where they can meet. Um, and and I also think that for, for me when I'm writing I want to be, you know, in the clearest mind that I can. Um, so it feels very much like uh, meditation or some kind of um, some kind of practice like that for me yeah I like I like the parallel to a contemplative practice but I think there's something in that meeting that you talk about the space where n neither person is really present like the reader isn't actually there the writer isn't actually there but that sort of um, sort of transsubjective experience that that meeting that you can't quite talk about that I think mm -hmm. might be kind of magical in that way yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so in the same essay, you also mention um, that as a child, you watched your mother's kind of clientele go up and down the stairs, and you sat on in this landing area. So I'm imagining it was sort of between floors, yeah. and um, this liminal space seems really important. And you've talked a little, but you've talked kind of around like liminality. So um, it makes me think of borders and border space, but also just this sense of in betweenness or the sense of being in a space where things are meeting but mm -hmm. no one's really present. And so I'm wondering if um, this liminal space is important to you and, and what happens? What do you think happens in the margins? Um, yeah, I, you know, um, when I was, when I was um, kind of watching my mother's clientele, you know, we were not a reading, we were not a reading family. Mm -hmm. So all the books that we had were encyclopedias and dictionaries. And then we had uh, new agey books that my mom had. And then we had um, Marxist literature, mm -hmm. and that was it. So the the stories that I could have access to were encyclopedias, and that's what I was reading. Um, but I was always just so fascinated by the clientele, mm -hmm. and it what I really wanted as a young kid was just stories. And so I kind of realized in one moment, like, oh, these are all, these are so many stories that are just going up and down. This, the stairs in my own house. Um, and I think that's when I really just became interested in what was going on upstairs in the attic and really wanted to just be a part of it. Um, but I, I do think that that in-betweenness um, of, you know, not being in the attic um, with, with those stories um, and maybe not being with a book that was actually feeding me. Um, really um, kind of made my imagination activate. Um, and yeah, there's something ab about when you hear like half a story that um, feels very rich as opposed to hearing the full story because then all the answers are there and then you don't have a place in it anymore. Um, but it's also um, a place of transgression which I think is is important for me as a as a uh, writer, mm -hmm. um, and that that also f uh, feeds my writing. Do you feel like you were looking for stories, or or were you just more fascinated with the half told story? I think I was. Well, you know, as a, as a young girl, um, one of the kind of first things that I noticed was how all the women around me 
what you know my mother or her friends or my aunts or my grandmother were seemed to be all kinds of victims mm. of something that I quite couldn't identify but I knew that it had to do with them being women mm -hmm. so I was very concerned as a young person because I felt that I was headed that way and that I needed to avoid whatever landmines those might you know those um, women around me had fallen uh, to uh, so I think that was it, it was a, it started like a very um, kind of calculated interest, like, oh, I need to figure this out, and I need to know what went wrong for, for all these women so that I can not have the, the future that they, that they currently have. Um, but, you know, it, um, and then I just fell into, uh, yeah, the, the kind of the, that magic of hearing somebody's experience and how that can expand your own imagination of, of yourself and, and your life. That's fascinating. I think also we have on one hand like these stories even if they're half told and then on the other hand this sort of like encyclopedia or collection of people that you see coming in and out or people that come in and out of our lives that kind of are just blurbs that we get and so I think that juxtaposition of story and collection of facts is really telling for how, how we sort of think about people and think about how we experience with people. Mm. Um, so uh, I think we see this a little bit in Fruit of the Drunken Tree, this, this sort of liminality or the margin space, where the family lives in a home that's surrounded by a gate, and even within the neighborhood there's a gate, and, and that's for very real reasons, for, for security. But also the mother plants this tree to keep out like prying eyes or to, to keep, you know, try, to, try and repel people from coming too close. Um, but Patrona enters this space and as an outsider, as a stranger. And then Chula then sees her home also as an outsider. So she goes at one point, they go to drop her off, and she enters it a little bit. And so this idea of being a stranger within a space that's structured to keep you out, or um, even in other spaces that are structured in the novel, so there's political and there's familial space. The, the bedroom, I think the parents' bedroom is really interesting. So this idea of them all laying in the bed and watching TV or entering that space. Um, and uh, Patrona's room within their home, that they go in there when she's not there and they look around. And I wonder how we can think about space as um, a sort of structure, but also as like a thing that's made by our experiences within it. And I wonder if you think about that in writing or if it's something that you're interested in. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that a lot. Um, uh, there were, you know, I was telling you like we were, we got really involved with uh, the lives of the young women that lived in our house. Um, and yeah, so I wasn't a kid that was outside playing with other kids. I was more a kid that was always inside trying to overhear adult conversations. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, so I would come home and I would just like sit in the kitchen and just visit, um, and just hear about what, um, these women's lives were like. Um, and it it was so um, unlike anything that I was that I was living living that I couldn't make sense of how we lived in the same city and could have such um, disparate realities. Um, and yeah, so even you know even when they would describe to me where they lived, um, how there were there were no gates for them and how. Um, and I did. We did go as a family and visit their houses too. Um, and you know, just there, there was one. There were kind of you know like more fun stories. Like uh, I remember, one story was that one woman's young woman's um, in one in her family. Her one brother was a was a robber, and the other uh, brother was a cop, and so they were constantly yeah. <laughs> kind of trying not to run into each other. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the, the brother who was uh, a thief would tell him, like, we're gonna like rob, you know, this, so just don't be near this right. area. <laughs> um, and then there were other things that were just kind of heartbreaking. Um, like there was a lot of violence that women had, had, endu had endured either from family members or like people in the neighborhood. Um, and there was a lot of like uh, like political things going on, uh, 
there one one day uh, one of the young, young women came and she was she was crying and we were trying to figure out what had happened to her and we were trying to help her um, and after hours she finally told us that her her dad had been murdered and that he had his body had been dismembered and had le been left on the streets and that she had just come from picking up the pieces and like putting them in a trash can or in a trash in a trash bag um, and so she, it, she was never sure who did it, but in Colombia, there's so many uh, violent groups, so it could have been the paramilitary or the guerrillas, or maybe it was like drug violence related, mm -hmm. that people don't want to ask questions because then it can get you into further uh, problems. Right. So, um, so I couldn't imagine that happening to me. Right. Um, but then, you know, different things happened to us. Um, but, um, yeah, I, it, it was like when, when, you know, middle class people in Bogota or in Colombia, like say the country is very safe, it has been safe for years, and then you talk to people who are, have been disenfranchised and you ask them how safe they feel and what they go through, and it, it doesn't seem like the same country at all. Right. Uh, so I was very interested as a writer in in that, in how the country itself has created um, these systems of protection for people who are from higher classes, and how those systems are completely gone for for people who have been disenfranchised. Um, I also felt that if I had been had been able to kind of like transgress that boundary, that class boundary, by listening that I, I wanted to write a book that did the same thing, where you could hear um, what life is like for a middle class person and what life is like for someone who has been displaced and you know, are living in a, in a, in a guerrilla occupied territory. I, and I think that that definitely comes through. There's definitely this um, division and yet there's such intimacy in the spaces where they do meet that it's just, I mean, it's mind blowing for a reader who hasn't experienced that. But then it's even more shaking, I think, too, or, or more jarring to realize that 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 is like reality, and that re that in those liminal spaces, in those spaces where we meet, um, these things come to the surface and they kind of boil up for us to see. Um, so you write about this a little bit in another essay. Um, Home is what you carry with you. Mm -hmm. And you talk about sort of being born at a border of a world that's meant to keep things out, and then also coming from people who were meant to be kept out of that world. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, in a sense, also a liminal space. And so I'm, I'm wondering what this in-betweenness means for you in terms of your writing. Mm -hmm. um, I think in my life it felt like a, like a gift that I came from the, being an outsider to things and never really truly be feeling like I fit in uh, was a gift. Um, and in, in writing, I think I always think of myself, you know, whatever kind of narrative point of view I take on, um, I always feel like it's a little bit of an outsider position. Um, and yeah, there's something, I think there's something um, interesting about that point of view because it allows you to to look at things um, from with distance um, and you know when, when it's even when they're they're good or terrible things um, and I don't know I I kind of uh, I kind of like fiction that reads like that too yeah. I think that goes back to that like stranger strangerness quality um, so then, is there a marginal language that you use or that you conceive of? I'm just wondering if there's something that is meant to be lost or kept outside within liminal spaces. And, and maybe this relates to migration or, or like you were talking about with translation, um, moving between borders, is there an advantage maybe even in remaining silent or resisting some sense of belonging or, or even representation if you're thinking about novels? I'm wondering even what about the secrets that Chula and Petrona and, and Chula's mother keep from each other and from you know the family and 
um, so much of the action seems driven by silence or by resistance or by secrecy. And I'm wondering how you sort of maintain that tension and then also use it to convey something. Mm. Um, yeah, silence, silence was something that I, that I was really interested in when I became an immigrant. Uh, I was meeting so many immigrants in the U.S., and I was noticing that there were, you know, a range of emotions to and kind of reactions to to what it is to arrive somewhere new and try to make a new life. Um, there were people who preferred silence, you know, when it came to their past, and they just wanted a new page and to just continue on and you know start a start a life as a new person. Uh, there were people who were kind of more just beholden to the past. Um, and because you're not living in the past and you're not living in the country where you came from, that also created a silence, uh, a different silence. Because uh, you can't share that with anyone. Uh, so it's your own private thing. Uh, so it, it kind of struck me that, that there were silences in, in these two kinds of people that I was kind of noticing. Uh, and I also noticed kind of a, a third kind of silence for myself, which was those moments when you're you're a new immigrant and then you're you just you're so different that you you want to hide it and you don't want to um, you know stick out. Uh, so so that silence was also intriguing. Intriguing. Um, yeah. So I I, I think that's uh, that's what I was thinking about. Um, when it when it comes to translation, um, I do think that there's things if you speak both languages, if you know Spanish and English, and you read the novel, you you will get a lot more of how the sentences are constructed, and uh, you can kind of appreciate more when it's uh, transliteration, because then you your your brain can access both things, right. um, and. Yeah, so I think that if if you don't speak uh, Spanish, all the what you get is just the strangeness of it, right. um, and yeah, and maybe that's and maybe that's okay. I don't think that um, to to kind of you know to over explain it would would ruin it. Right. Yes. Yeah. So it seems like um, that just perceiving the strangeness is is enough. That's excellent, and I think to the silence can be in those half-heard stories. So maybe as an outsider, like what do you what do you almost hear or what do you how do you fill in those gaps? I think that can be really interesting. So um, again, about language, we've talked about it a lot, but I, I'm remembering a specific part in the novel where um, Cassandra corrects Chula about like a linguistic difference where she says something like there's a difference between being shot and being shot at. And so, um, did you did you then think about those conversations in English or in Spanish? You said you thought. Did you think the whole thing in Spanish and then write it in English? I'm just wondering, uh, was that linguistic difference in English or in Spanish, and in, in the way that Cassandra's like finessing it for Chula mm -hmm. to understand? And then, and yeah. So, what what was that part like? Um, that part, I think. Uh yeah, it was interesting. I was going back and forth. I think that part I was just thinking in English mm -hmm. for that part, yeah. Because in Spanish, we would just say, I don't know, le dispararon. Like, I don't know if there's a difference between, yeah, I, I don't know what you would say. Yeah. No, I, I, can, I couldn't <laughs> think of it. I couldn't think. I, yeah. and, I, and I think that there's so much that you can leave open to interpretation in Spanish that you just know. And so, like, and then I'm picturing as an older sister, how she's talking to her again, saying, no, 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 that's not <laughs> what it is. You know what I mean? So, like, there's so much that you can interpret in that way. Yeah. So, that's fascinating. Um, do you think the story, the structure of the novel is, do you think of it as a duet? Are they, are, 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 are Chula and Petrona two sides of the same coin? Are they two voices, two selves, or, or two selves who are so intertwined it's impossible to separate? Um... I'm, yeah, I'm glad that you, you picked up on duality. I was thinking of, of the structure of the novel as a mirror. Mm -hmm. um, because when when the novel starts, um, Chula is kind of very, um, she's a very kind of happy child. Um, and Petrona is this 
this uh, young girl who comes to their house and she's an outsider. And because of her being an outsider, she's very silent. She's like keeping a lot of her difference to herself. Um, and there's this, there's this moment where both of them cross over. Um, and uh, Chula ends up as a refugee in the US. Um, and she kind of becomes like Petrona um, at that point. And she, she becomes an outsider. And she's also holding a lot of things in. And, and um, there's, there's a silence uh, because of what has happened to her. Um, and one of the kind of driving questions for Chula in the beginning is why is Petrona so, so quiet? Um, and I, so I think she becomes that in the end. Like she comes to know, like personally in her body, why that would be. Um, and yeah, and I also, it, it begins and opens with letters. Um, so I tried, I did try to make it, um, the chapters even have mirror chapters in the beginning and the end. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's just so narratively and thematically tight. It's like so well crafted that Thank those you. two things. I mean, it I, that is definitely what I was thinking about in the yeah. end. And then even Petrona says in the final letter, she says, "What could I have said other right. than this?" There's so much weight in this thing that says nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think it's easy to forget that Petrona is 13, 14, 15 years old. Um, but, but Chula, at least in the beginning, sort of maintains yeah. this very sort of childlike affect. And maybe that's because she's sheltered. Um, and, uh, but she's not untouched by the things that are happening around her. Um, and then she developed this strategy of maintaining sort of a flat affect to, to show that nothing's bothering her so that way like, she's not different or she's not changed so she doesn't have to go talk to a psychiatrist. Um, but, uh, but she can't be seen to be dealing with the trauma, whereas Petrona also has a sort of like flat affect in which she doesn't show that she's also dealing with trauma. So I'm wondering, is, is Chula sort of the ideal narrator? Because I feel like Petrona's sections are so reserved still. Even though we're getting her voice, she's mm -hmm. still so controlled. And so I'm wondering if, if Chula is the, the one who has to give us this story. Mm -hmm. You know, I did feel that way when I was writing um, Petrona's chapters. Um, it felt like I was almost forcing her to say something. Um, and I, I always thought that, that the things that Petrona goes through um, are so much more terrible than anything that Chula goes through. Um, that I think her character is is trying to to keep a handle on her life, and that if she were to say all the things that happened, um, and maybe you know even say how what that means to her or how that makes her feel or even explore her feelings a little bit, um, there's a feeling that I get that she would just kind of unspool and and break apart. Uh, so it so it seems like her silence for her was also an act of uh, self-preservation. Um, and, and Chula, you know, yeah, the, though she is not unaffected by the things that happened to her, um, it, it is also not as bad as what Petrona is going through. Um, and I think so it, it makes it possible for her to be more open and to, to be, um, yeah, be able to go into what you know exactly what the sequence of events was and exactly how much did she lose and exactly you know how does that make her feel now right, yeah. yeah it seems almost like she can contain this memory and and this ability to convey what happened whereas Petrona cannot or can't or or won't allow herself to do yeah yeah um so the the characters and, and I think this is a related question it seems like there's a difference between between being adjacent to violence and having violence be like an integral part of your life. And so I find myself feeling sympathy for Chula and I feel like um, uh, you know that, that her experiences are important. But I really feel viscerally those things that happen when we get Petrona, specifically her voice. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's a visceral feeling. She's, she's so slight and, and with her narratives and She's haunting and, and enigmatic. And um, I'm wondering if you attach certain feelings to these characters, if you feel a certain way about them. Mm. 
Yeah, it's it's kind of like um, I felt like when I knew that I was going to write from one of their point of views, it felt like I was you know making a date with a friend specifically, and so Chula is I knew what to expect. I knew like okay, like some some things may happen and she might you know go through some traumatic things, but it it feels like she's always going to be funny in a surprising way, like in a morbidly like <laughs> you know uh, childish way so it, it was very entertaining and then on days when I knew that I that I would be spending time with Petrona then I, I actually had some anxiety I felt some anxiety because I knew that there was there was a lot there like hiding beneath what she was saying um, and and writing her parts um, were I always kind of wrote her chapters in a rush, um, and it felt like I just had to empty myself enough to to allow for the rush to to come. So very uh, visceral feeling. Very also. visceral, yeah. um, much more intense. It felt very intense. Um, I didn't I didn't ever feel like she was going to make a joke in the middle of something right. terrible happening. Right. And I think in that way, sometimes it's almost not necessarily better, but we get a clearer picture, even though we're getting it by degrees, when we hear Tula's assumptions about Petrona. We hear that she's a saint, or she's a poet, or a ghost, or a victim, or something like that. And um, even Tula's mother sees herself in Petrona. She like kind of projects herself onto her. So I'm wondering, what does Petrona see? Um, and how, how do we understand interrupted girlhood and womanhood through these lenses? Um, we end with her voice, and but does that convey? Does that disrupt the lenses, or, or does it seek to convey more of that? Mm. Um, yeah, I th I think that there's a there's always a distortion that happens with privilege. Mm. So um, there, just you know, the family has all these assumptions about Petrona. They also assume that they can help her, you know, which they obviously cannot. By the end of the book, like you see how over their heads they were to think that they could they could help. Um, and I think for when Petrona um, comes into their house, there's, there's, there's this other, she can almost like see everything play out. Like she can see what they're, they're putting on her. Um, and she can see just like both realities. Like she, she knows, she, she knows she can be surprised, for example, that there's doors inside their house, right. that there's like a kitchen door and that there are doors that you can open and inside is a heater and that there's doors to the bedroom, like things that she doesn't have in her own living space. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so I think Petrona is always the character that is actually seeing more of everything than, than anyone else. Um, and even when Chula's family go to see Petrona's space, um, it, it's still distorted by, by their privilege and by um, the things that they assume. Yeah. It's, so, it's so visceral still. I mean, I, I finished reading it about a week ago, and I'm still feeling all of these <laughs> things as you talk about them. Um, so... Is, there's a lot of conversation about choice in the novel, about choices that are inherently given to us because of privilege or choices that we are forced to make. And I'm wondering how you see agency playing into that. Is, is our choices agentic, or are they always determined by our lived experience and our space that we are in? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so one of the things I was thinking about was about how... Um, you you know who who can become an immigrant and who cannot become an immigrant, mm -hmm. um, and I, I maybe in the U.S. we get so many stories of, I arrived I'm an immigrant here's my story and you get the the story from then on, right. um, and I was I was interested in telling, this is how I got here, but then also a story that was, I had no chance I had no, kind of way to escape my situation and here's where I still am. Mm -hmm. And this other girl that I had a relationship with, and we like lived through the, through the thing that kind of broke us apart together. She was able to 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 leave the situation and escape and become an immigrant. Um, so I I was interested in in that story too, 
I don't know if we if we get to hear that or if we uh, I think we've started to unpack you know what kind of privilege is inherent in you being able to, to become an immigrant um, but I don't know if we've been doing that enough or even thinking about that on a yeah on the level that maybe governments should be yeah. um, thinking about it um, yeah, I think I think that also speaks to that silence that we talked about. This idea that like you have to tell some kind of story, and that like your success is predicated on like how much you have suffered or how much you were able to overcome, whereas it should be enough to just be. Um, yeah. So, um, I was really attached to the family structure in the Santiago family. This this uh, phrase that you use, a kingdom of women. I really love that phrase and. Um, but it seems like a fragile kingdom. Like it can only exist in certain circumstances. And so I'm wondering if this is related to the political realities of Colombia that you saw, or is this more a universal question of gender relations and, and family structures? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was thinking about kind of what I witnessed in Colombia a lot. Um, and just I was, I was saying earlier how much I just adored being around women um, especially if it was just a group of tias in the kitchen and they're all kind of telling stories, uh, the things that we would talk about would dissipate if any uncle or any cousin kind of walked in through the door. So it did feel like a very fragile kingdom that could always be interrupted. Um, and, you know, there's so many, there's so many novels and books about this era that you know, talk about like Pablo Escobar being on the run, and that talk about like the violence of the '90s, um, centering men mm -hmm. like, who are like men in power and what they were doing and what their lives were like. Um, and I wanted to tell a story where that was there, but maybe it was in the background, mm -hmm. and in the center of that were were women, and kind of um, how how were they affected? Because in any you know, situation where there's a breaking down of systems or, you know, there's violence suddenly or there's war, women are always the ones that have it worse. Um, so, uh, but there's also a magic that happens with that. So even though, um, you know, in that, in that space again with, with the tias, they would talk about kind of like the terrible things that they had gone through in their lives. Um, but it, there was also this sense that they were stronger because of it or that they were able to, to find or pull out from themselves a strength that they did not know they possessed. Uh, and that to me was, was something that I, you know, was worthy of me kind of honoring in a book. I, I remember when I was first like invited into that space as like an adult, you know, and, and that feeling of being among women I think was really, I think that's the reason I feel such an attachment to this idea of the kingdom of yeah. women, because I, I remember exactly the moment I was invited into the kitchen with the tias to hear all these things. Yeah, um, but, and there was also, uh, I was also, I didn't do this on, in, on purpose, but it, it kind of happened just organically in the book that um, uh, Pablo Escobar is someone who's on the run constantly, so he's a missing male um, to the whole country, right, and then, um, and then the father is constantly missing throughout the book, even in the beginning, because he's always working in other cities, and that's kind of what allows the kingdom of, of women to happen. Yeah. Um, so I was always interested in that, in just male absence and right. what that means. You know, like men have all these power, and then they they're absent, and then they leave women in this kind of wrecked right. landscape. Right. And how do women? survive that and how, how do they kind of help each other, how do they fall victim to that. And there is a really funny part, I think, where they talk about how eventually it just became he would be home and it wasn't a big deal that he was coming home and they'd be just be like, oh, you're here. Yeah. I didn't know you. When did you get here? Yeah. <laughs> and he's just in the same home that they're in and they just randomly <laughs> run into him. Um, I love, too, that movement you described from the margin to the center and then moving the center out into the margins in terms of gender. Um, I'm wondering what that does to the body to be moved to the center also. Um, I think that there's a lot of trauma and sort of like unspecified violence that happens to the body. 
Um, Petrona's body, of course, is particularly vulnerable, and her and her little sister. Um, it seems, you know, as soon as she as soon as soon as they start menstruating, mm -hmm. they are women and they are susceptible to this violence. Um, but also the image of the abuela after the attack, and they go. She she couldn't feel any pain until hours and hours later. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you can talk about how you approach these kinds of images. Um, without making the story center on extreme violence. You know, so we have these moments, or we have even the Barbies, or we have um, the assault itself. So I'm thinking about how, how being central sort of opens you up to violence also. Mm. Um, I think this came from, uh, from just watching women in Colombia talk about things that had happened to them where it felt like the whatever trauma had happened was, um, you know, like a side thing that had taken place. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was, I think, um, when you're so vulnerable, you know, one of the choices that you can make is um, to, to make yourself kind of more rugged. So, and you kind of underline on your own joy, whatever that can be, and you underline on your own um, ability to, to move on and continue. Um, so yeah, so I think for, for Chula, she, she sees all these things and she can still um, center herself in some kind of humor about it or some kind of like surreal understanding of death. Um, or what it means, like if somebody gets blown up, like what does that mean to her? Um, and yeah, I I think the the it's the way that I've always heard that story of like this happened to me. Um, it the violence is is shocking, you know, um, but I think that witnessing kind of that uh, spirit to just want to be joyous anyway and, and just want to uh, have a life anyway in spite of everything. Um, that felt like more more important to me. Um, and just the inner lives of women are are so much more important than the, than the things that happen to them. Um, even not to say that it's not important at all. Um, but just that one thing like the inner life is what is uh, make you a human being and the things that happen to you are, um, you know, they, they affect you and they try to bind you and kind of like um, keep you down. Uh, so in a way, dwelling on the, on the thing that can make you move forward is, is a, maybe like a better, better thing. Um, so I think when I was, when I was writing, um, uh, I didn't want to give, uh, a lot of page space to to those um, moments of violence, but maybe I wanted to give more space to to how women are dealing with that in the aftermath, or how their moments of joy like before that. Yeah, I I feel like the 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 violence is necessary. Like you have to say it, you have to see it, mm -hmm. um, in the same way that the characters are being forced to live it, but. So much of the conflict seems to rest in like uh, almost arbitrary inescapability. It's, it's almost Kafkaesque sometimes the way that the that it's just bad luck or bad circumstances. And I'm wondering if you can talk through the way that you hold that tension throughout the novel. Mm. Um, so I, um, you know, when I when I'm writing, I don't have a lot of plans for what is going to happen. And I'm, I'm one of those writers that just feels like I'm just walking into a dark room and I'm just kind of like feeling around in the dark and then something makes sense and I go that way. Um, so I didn't know, I didn't know a lot of like the, the turns that the novel takes. Um, and there were, there were times where I really didn't want something bad to happen to the characters, but then once it kind of came out of the writing, um, I was just kind of like heartbroken to have to write it and go in that direction. Um, so yeah, I, I think the that tension just happened organically when I when I was writing it. Do you ever feel like you rein yourself in 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 the editing or in the um, revising process? Um, 
to not to not to I, I mean you could I mean yes in terms of the violence but also do you do you find yourself bringing yourself back since you don't write with such a plan and it's more of like an experience I'm wondering if the editing or revising process is a reining in or is it just a clarifying how does that work for you I think it's a clarifying I so I'm a writer I don't do a lot of I know that there's writers that when they do a first draft, they just write for mm. forever. And they just write so many things that they end up cutting. Mm. I am I'm very um, yeah more like choosy about the things that I write. So even my first draft is very compact. Okay. Um, and then the editing that I do is actually expanding oh. things. Um, so I I wrote a very compact version of the novel the first time around. Um, and it actually stopped in the in the airplane when Chula is in the airplane and her family are, is on their way to the US. Right. It stopped there. Wow. Um, and yeah, and then, and then so there was a lot of expanding more than taking things out. That's interesting. I've always, I'm always fascinated with process. Um, so the drunken tree, I want to come back to that just a little bit. Um, it's dangerous and it's beautiful and um, it's one of the first images that we get in the novel. So uh, it, it seems to function as one of those metaphors that implies truth that we talked about from your essay. And, and I'm wondering how you see this tension and, and what do you think the truth is of the drunken tree? Um, so, I, so when I was growing up in Bogota, we did have that tree in our garden and I was uh, in my apartment in San Francisco, there was also, well, there was a California variety of that tree in that garden. Um, so I was doing edits and just, this tree was just constantly on my mind. Um, and I, th I think at some point, I, you know, I was just like reading about the history and um, just found so interesting the toxi toxicity of the tree. Um, that it can, um, so it, if you, uh, you can make it, we have this drug in Colombia, it's called Burinaga. Um And if you're exposed to it, it takes your free will away. Um, and it's such a creepy thing to be available in nature. Um, and it's, it's also like a very beautiful, like so fragrant, um, and I think in the end, when I was when I was thinking about this tree and having it be such a central part of the book, and everything kind of um, hinges on on this tree in the end, um, and the and the drug, um, that it, it kind of started to to seem to me like it was a symbol for Colombia, um, just this very this very beautiful place, this very kind of alluring. Uh, place um, that has this danger running through it, right. and even it seems like even if you know the danger, it's still it's still alluring. It's still yeah. alluring, <laughs> yeah. You still want to be near it. Um, so genre, um, it it's it's realism. I mean, it is real. It's absolutely what's happening. It seems like realism that's affected in different ways. Um, it's alternately magical, marvelous, mysterious. Um, it also has this kind of buildings room on, but it's like, like you said, the mirrored buildings room on, where one switches for the other. Um, how, how did you intend it? Did you think about it, or did you think about flooring those, or is it just what happened naturally? Um, you know, I, I always thought um, that there's, when you read a lot of the magical realism, uh, literature, it feels, uh, I've, I've seen something like that, uh, and I think every South American has seen something like that, uh, like in their own lives or in their own cultures or like the towns that they're from, right. but it's not quite as fabulous right. as that. Um, and I was more interested in what it's actually like, like the, the cultural experience of of magical realism, or like what outsiders would call like superstition. Right. Um, and so I think in the book I was just I was just trying to portray what it really is like to live in in Colombia mm -hmm. and to be in that culture where um, you know more things are possible uh, because we believe that culturally. Um, so you know, Chula goes around her neighborhood like looking for this 
spot where you can maybe see the, the souls of Purgatory as they make their way. Um, she doesn't know where from where to where. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that anybody in South America, if I told, said that, like, oh, I used to do this as, as a girl, which I did not, that was invented, they, they would probably say, like, oh, yeah, you know, that makes complete sense, you know? Yeah, I love that. I loved <laughs> that part, talking about searching for purgatory yeah. to find someone that you can get to tell you so I loved it. Um, yeah, I get, I get very, I, uh, I, I like to start fights with people about magical realism yeah. because I think in, in academic spaces yeah. and in sort of like popular vernacular of talking about um, magical realism outside of the culture, you lose yeah. that reality or you lose yeah. this idea that like this is real. It's not, it's yeah. not fantasy in the way that we understand fantasy. Yeah. Um, I also get upset when I've met writers who are... North American and they're and they're white and they're trying to write magical realism, because right. then I'm like, well, but you don't like this has a this has a cultural like birthing right. place, right. Um, so you can't just right. write it. Yeah. Um, so I also like to start fights yes. about that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go out and get them together. Yeah. yeah. Um, you also write in a lot of different genres. I've mentioned some essays that you've written about different mediums and modes. I'm wondering if you approach writing differently in those different modes. Um, let's see. I think so, yeah. Um, I don't, I think one thing that is similar is that I don't have plans for anything. Mm -hmm. So even if it's an essay, I don't actually have a plan when I sit down to write it. Um, you know what I do every day when I'm, when I'm starting my work day is I keep a dictionary by my desk mm -hmm. and then I open it to random pages and point to a random word. Mm -hmm. And I will do that three times. And I will write um, two short fictions and then a nonfiction idea that's a response to whatever word I get. Interesting. Um, and so, and so, a lot of essays have come from this exercise, mm -hmm. and a lot of scenes have probably come from that exercise. Um, but yeah, um, when when I'm writing nonfiction. Um, Obviously, it's, it's a different animal, so it, I have to do things like research and do interviews, um, although I did do a lot of like journalistic research for this book, for the novel as well. Um, but yeah, so there's things that are similar and different about how I approach it. Did you refer to your notes when you were then writing this, or did you just sort of like have it in the back of your head? Um, so I took a whole year and did a lot of research where I was just, one of the things that I did was I read every issue of the newspaper from 1989 to 1995. Oh, wow. Um, I read maybe like six books on Pablo Escobar. Um, I, I did a lot of, I actually interviewed former guerrilla members for it just to understand, because uh, I think I was, I was trying to get around my own assumptions of that because I knew that I had them mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to know why someone would want to join a, a guerrilla group right. um, and that was surprising the things that I found were surprising um, and I think that they allowed me to to write um, Petrona's chapters uh, with with more of a kind of grounding in, in what um, that that life might entail like her life what that might entail that's, I um, feel like, again, that goes back to agency and choice and like what, what just reality is. Um, yeah. So a uh, similar question, you're a writer, you teach, and you work with the um, Immigrants' Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. You do some work with high school students. Um, you, you do so much. And all, are all of these jobs separate for you, or do they inform sort of like one sort of main thrust in your life? Um, yeah, I have like 10 jobs. Um, <laughs> Um, I think they're all centered around stories. Uh, so even when I'm, I'm working with, uh, I've been working with uh, newcomers in, in San Francisco for the past year. Um, and so they've, they're immigrants who have just very recently uh, crossed the border and come into the US. Mm -hmm. And they're also young, they're young people. Um, and so I'm always trying to get to get us to a place where they can 
feel safe sharing their experiences, um, which is not something that they want to do because it's so traumatic and so recent that they don't necessarily want to go there. Um, but I but I see my job as kind of um, stories are, are an important part of how we can heal and how we can put language to things that if we don't, then we're the worst for it. Um, so I, yeah, so I've, I come up with, you know, art projects for them, or uh, we recently uh, studied like a recipe form, and then I had them write recipes for whatever they wanted to kind of write about their like experience. So some of them wrote, um, you know, like recipe for your first day in the U.S. Um, and and that that poem uh, was the student was describing like his first um, his first day in the U.S. in a detention center. Um, so so there's I'm very interested in how providing um, kind of like a container where you can explore kind of traumatic things, but in a, in a parallel way, so that you're not kind of going into the into the heat of, of that experience. Um, yeah, so I'm, and I'm, do a lot of criticism, and that's me just sharing my love for stories. And then I'm writing, which is me also just being in love with stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah so I love I that there, se there seems like stories can give you so much and yeah. like can be a balm or a medicine for you. I love that. Um, there's an abiding tension, I think, between, between U.S. as the land that saved us, as it says in the book, and then the really disparaging marks, remarks that were made um, that you talk about in an essay of your first day as uh, becoming a citizen. Um, so uh, is there a place where that can mean, is this a place that can mean two things? Is there a paradox? Can you hold those two things at once? Is that a liminal space also? Um, I think it has to be. I mean, it, that is what it is. That that first, when I took my oath, I very much felt like that was that was the reality of being an immigrant in the U.S. today. Um, so I think it had just been MLK Day when I when I took my oath. So one of the things that we were in the um, Oakland Paramount Theater, and the, and the place is just filled with immigrants and their and their families. Um, and one of the things that they that they screened, there's like, there's a screen in the back. Um, one of the things that they screened was, um, I have a dream speech. So, yeah, I just kind of like looked around and everyone is just <laughs> just like wiping um, their tears. Um, and then you know, we we took our we took our oath. We all stood up. We took our oath. Um, we, I was sitting next to, to this Mexican man, and he really didn't want to be emotional and throughout the whole thing. He was just like, I'm not going to cry. Like, this is not. And then um, we took our oath. Like, we sang the, uh, the national anthem for the first time. And then we sat, and he's, and he's just like try, still trying not to cry. And he's just like, this is such an intense experience. Um, and then, but then um, we get. There's like a pre-recorded message from Trump mm -hmm. where he's welcoming welcoming us as new Americans, mm -hmm. um, and I just after taking our oath, I sit down and I look at my phone, and there's like a news notification which says, um, you know, Trump has just called these countries like shithole countries. Um, so the the dissonance of just watching the I have a dream speech with this news not notification um, and this kind of like contained message of, of welcome, um, all of those things are America. So you, you sound both accepting of this and then also, I mean, when you first started talking, a little bit optimistic. So I'm wondering if you if you write with that optimism in mind, if you if you work with that optimism in mind, if you think that stories will heal us, or if you think we'll always be in that paradox, um, I don't know if we'll always be in that paradox. Um, you know, just uh, you know, even uh, Martin Luther King didn't you know 
it wasn't in the end like it didn't he he did all these wonderful things and then he was right assassinated mm -hmm. um so it it does feel like uh we there are we can we can make it a better place like we can do that um and it's not it's not the better place that you know that speech implies right it's a, it's a better place maybe because that speech was was said um and we can strive for that um but we are definitely not there yet so then um our, our last question what's next for you as you as you go on and you continue to work with stories um well so i'm working on i'm working on a memoir next is what i'm doing um, will it cover some of this period in your life that, that you had inspiration from the book? Um, the, no, the, so the memoir is going to center around my grandfather um, and my mother, and then it's, it's kind of a story about inheritance and, you know, the, the real magical realism, not the, not the literary piece. <laughs> I love that. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you for being so generous with your time and yeah, coming you. to visit us today. And I'm looking very much looking forward to your reading tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much.